What happened in this case? I'll leave that picture up. Anyone? So, Any um, Danielle, okay. Yeah. Walter Salmon bought the, or leased from Louisa Jerry, the Hotel Bristol in New York on Fifth Avenue. And the lease was for 20 years. And then he went into a joint venture with Meinhard, and Meinhard invested $100,000 to turn the hotel into um, just some shops and offices. And it was going to cost about $200,000 for these alterations um, to the premises. So the lease was for 20 years. By the time the lease was up, Louisa had died and her son took over. Hmm. Her son's name is Elbridge. And he at first did not want to continue the lease. He wanted to just sell the whole block, do a lot more property, and demo, like, just do a mass demolition and build new things. But he couldn't get that to work out, so he w goes to Salmon and offers Salmon all of this property that he wants to get rid of. And Salmon goes into a private deal with Jerry to buy those at the expiration of the 20-year lease. And my heart <coughs> is upset with that because he wanted to get in on this much larger real estate venture. So he sues for his 50% share. Mm -hmm. And uh, does he win? He does. He does win, right? Also important to, remember, to get the holding there. So, so let's talk in a little more detail there. Thank you for those overall facts, right? So, so then. Who were these parties? You said there was Meinhardt and Salmon, and they got into a joint venture. What were their roles in that venture? Yeah. Um, so Walter Salmon was, I guess, the agent. He was the one responsible for leasing the property, getting tenants, um, maintaining the buildings, and Meinhardt was the investor. Yeah, so, you know, has anyone here stayed at a building that had a superintendent who lived on premises? So, Mary Beth. Uh, what was that? What was that like? Oh, the super super was the guy who basically ran the building, mm -hmm. uh, not, not business wise, but the management of the actual thing, the physical. Did he own the building? He did not. No, it's uncommon for the owner of the building to live in the building and run the building, right? So he's the, as you pointed out, Danielle pointed out, the uh, the the property manager or the agent here, and <laughs> on the other hand, Meinhard is like. Patrick in our in our example he's providing the money right the money not here for lawn equipment but for a rather expensive building in New York City and so one way to think of these people is one is providing money and another word for money is capital uh, oh well, oh shoot it's oh well isn't it capital no, capital it's okay a -L. A -L. capital and labor that I know how to spell Right? We have one person who's providing money or capital and one is person labor. Now, anyone remember some debates or some type of, I don't know, communist country that had a whole thing about capital and labor? Right? We had an entire movement in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s. Right? This, whole, this whole fight between management uh, or, or, or capital, really, and labor. And, and we could actually understand some of the capitalist uh, concepts through some of that lens. Right? So we have the people that are doing the work and we have the people that are making the investments. And as we go through this course, I want you to think critically about, about that because these, it, this issue, the fact that there were people who would make passive investments and the fact that there are people who would spend their life and their effort has resulted in revolutions, has resulted in wars, has resulted in uh, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of um, anarchy and, and changes in the world. Right? So these are really fundamental concepts that people have strong feelings about. Now, America is primarily a capitalist country, which means that we have a lot of access to investment, not unbridled, but it primarily runs on that model. If it were a socialist country, there would essentially be no private ownership. You would just have labor. And that's a fundamental difference in, in, our, in our structures. But anyway, here we have a joint venture, and we have an individual who's going to provide the capital, Meinhardt. An individual is going to provide the labor, Salmon. And as Danielle pointed out, uh, during the process of this relationship, things seem to go a little south. Yeah? And so uh, while Salmon should have, uh, apparently, told Meinhard that there was an offer, he decided to take that opportunity for himself. Someone came to him and said, by the way, it's a lovely building you're managing. I would like to you know, do a larger deal involving that building and many others. Are you interested? And he said, yes, I am. 
Unfortunately, he wasn't the owner of that building. He was just the manager of it. He was a steward. And so uh, we have some very, very colorful language from Cardozo about that. What does Cardozo say about Salmon's uh, actions? Any, any fun quotes from Cardozo about, about how we should feel about this behavior? Well, first off, he calls them co-adventurers. Co-adventurers. Right? And so he says that, first off, these people are co-adventurers, and so they have a duty to each other akin to the duties partners would have for each other. And the duties partners have for each other, we're going to extrapolate into our corporate world as well. But he says that, okay, it was a joint venture. Some joint ventures have less or more responsibility, but we're going to equate this joint venture to a partnership and call them co-adventurers. And who has the heavier burden of that, of that co-adventure responsibility? Salmon. Why does Cardozo say Salmon has the heavier weight? Why, why should the manager have a higher obligation? Give it, yeah. So as, but if he's doing all the work, like maybe we could think of it the other way. Since he's doing all the work, shouldn't he get all the benefit? I mean, he's doing all the work. So why should he have any responsibilities other than doing the work? Yeah, Tyler. Like he's the only one that would know what's happening with the property. Mm. So they could never know that the investor's there and could just be one of the silent partners. So when you see the building, you see salmon, you don't see the other guy. You see salmon, right? When you see the building, you see salmon. Uh, and, and exactly right. So what we have here, I'm going to use an economic term, we have something called an information asymmetry. Right? One party has more information than the other by the structure of their relationship. There's an information asymmetry favoring Salmon. He's on the ground. A person wants to buy the building, Salmon hears about it. Prices next door go up, go down, Salmon knows about it. Meinhardt is off in his bungalow somewhere, or whatever he's doing, investing his money in other projects. He's not present. And so because of this asymmetry, it might make sense that Meinhardt has expectations of Salmon to be forthcoming, right? to be uh, honest. Cardozo actually makes the statement, which is not, he, he makes a couple statements here which are not technically, let's say, true. Um, those of you who had me in contracts know I like to pick on Cardozo because he likes to use really, really fancy words and sometimes they're actually wrong, uh, but they sound pretty. And so, you know, it's kind of a fun one to pick on. And there's a couple things in here too, but I'll get to the, I'll get to the reason why I think this is still an important case to teach. According to Cardozo, he says the standard of, of this obligation has to be applied with uncompromising rigidity, uh, we'll see as we learn the actual corporate law. There is some flexibility here. There are, we'll learn about uh, mandatory rules versus default rules. But he does say that, uh, that there is this duty, and he has a very famous quote. Anyone want to guess? My next slide here was the famous quote where Cardozo defined this duty. Cardozo says that this partnership duty, especially from Salmon to Meinhardt, especially from the labor to the capital, especially from the agent to the principal, especially from the worker to the investor, is a duty not of honesty alone, but the punctilio of an honor the most sensitive. That is the standard of behavior. So let's let those words sort of sink in. I'll come back to the fact that they're actually not true, but they're still meaningful and valuable. But these are pretty powerful words. In fact, they're so powerful that one of my favorite law professors, Professor Bainbridge, compared this rhetoric to the story of the Good Samaritan. Seriously. Anyone here know the story of the Good Samaritan? Anyone here know the Bible stories? Know Luke 10, 25 to 37? Someone has to know this. I'll tell the story. Okay, fine. There's a lawyer talking to Jesus, which is always a good start to a joke, but this is... <laughs> and the lawyer, the lawyer is saying, how do I gain eternal life? 
fed Jesus. Uh, he says to Jesus, actually, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as well. And Jesus says, you know, basically, yeah, that's correct, right? You pass the Socratic dialogue. We're going to, okay, good. Right, that's the answer to, to eternal life. And then the story continues uh, and talks about uh, several uh, ostensibly good men who see an injured person by the side of the road and walk by, but the Samaritan picks him up, takes him home, bandages him, takes care of him. And that's the definition of a neighbor, someone who is going out of their way. And what this article actually suggested, and I've got an extra copy here for those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, is, is Cardozo's punctilio of honor is this the same sort of self-effacing, self-neglect um, self at, at, for the sake of another that was posited here? And again, I didn't write the article. I thought it very interesting. But it was, there was enough in this article to suggest that. And uh, take, a look at the, take a look at the language here. Tell me, and I think there's a good argument for Cardozo really, really overstating, we'll say overstating, the obligation of one partner to another, especially the manager to the investor. And it's related to the concept of agape. Agape is God's love. It's a particular kind of love. It's contrasted with filio. Filio is like friendship, right? It's sort of love for another, but it's sort of, a, if you will, a more selfish sort of love. Like, I love you because I enjoy spending time with you, whereas agape is sort of, I love you and I would do anything for you, even at the extinguishing of my own self, right? So these are sort of two different views, and um, the theologists never said that agape is a willingness to let the self be destroyed rather than let the other cease to be. It is the commitment of the self by self-binding will to make the other great. And my interests are completely unimportant, even my own life, for the sake of yours. Cardozo seems to be saying something almost at that extreme level. He says, the Bugtolio principle, loyalty that pricks one's own possible rationalization of self-interest with a sharp point of selflessness. Cardozo seems to be suggesting that the partner, that Salmon in this case, has this obligation to completely bury his own interest for the sake of the partnership. So just kind of interestingly, did he intend this metaphor? Well, probably not. He was a Jew, not a Christian, and not a particularly... Uh, active Jew, he was a Sephardic Jew, so he was not even exposed uh, necessarily in his, in his upbringing to as many Christian virtues as Ashkenazi or, or Western Jews. Sephardic Jews are from Spain and uh, North Africa, Morocco, and so they tend to live among Arab countries. He probably would not have heard this, par this parable in his upbringing. He also apparently stopped attending services after his bar mitzvah, which is pretty common, uh, although he did have some exposure to theology and philosophy, so he probably did not intend to make such an extreme metaphor. But why did he say it then? Why say such bold things that sound almost like the duty to efface oneself for the sake of one partner? Well, I use this as the opening bid on this year-long course because I want us to remember that much of corporate law is about right and wrong. It may seem like these are boring stories about financials, what have you, but these topics about fraud, about partnership, about loyalty, about truth, about honor, about self-effacement are really about right and wrong, about good and bad. And I think that corporate law, at its best, aspires to have these sort of standards, aspires to have this agape. Now, of course, as we'll see in just a minute, this concept does not really fit with what courts do. Right? Courts do not judge what's in the heart, they judge what's in the action. Well, maybe criminals, they do something terrible, like if you have a bad heart, mens rea, that sort of thing as well. But in the corporate context, we're really not so concerned, and we don't really have the tools to see into men's hearts and men's souls. The law, and Cardozo again here, was not really speaking about the law. The law really only requires some minimum standards of conduct to avoid liability. So what was Cardozo saying? Cardozo was saying that there is more to corporate law than, a, than meeting a minimum standard. And that something more was maybe like being the Good Samaritan, was, was focusing on the needs of the partnership, the needs of the other. Now, how do I know this? Well, I know that Cardozo didn't really mean what he said because he also was a drafter of the Uniform Partnership Act. So we actually, when he actually sat down to write black letter law, 
right, in a uniform act. I, I can, this I can see into his mind, what he said in his comment, a partner as such is not a trustee. Not even a trustee, forget Good Samaritan, forget self-effacing, self-denying love, not even a trustee. A partner's rights as an owner are balanced against his duty as an agent and a fiduciary. So as I mentioned, we'll see that Meinhard and Solomon is not here to teach you the law. It's here to give you some sensitivity about what corporate law is trying to accomplish. And as Bainbridge continues, why is this, sta why is this uh, standard unsuitable? Right? Why do we not have a legal standard? I mean, there are some advantages. Right? We could say that anyone in a business relationship must put the needs of the business before the needs of themselves even to the ends of the earth, even to the ends of the person. Right? I have to go and work for Patrick even though I have allergies and I cut the lawn. Right? And, or, or I, you know, I, there's nothing of myself that I can take from the partnership. Why is that not the standard? Well, there have been a couple theories, and again, you know, these are words, uh, but I think they have meaning. One is a uh, 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 theologist, um, Daniel David McCluskey, uh, a, a Catholic the, the, theologian said that, you know, we don't, ha we don't live in this age, right? Not in corporate, not in our personal lives. The age, this age is one of mere iron or aluminum or plastic, not pagan gold or Christian silver. And maybe Dr. Martin Luther King said it even better. The law cannot make people love their neighbors, but it can stop them from lynching them. And that's what corporate law is here to do. It's not here to make partners love each other. It's not meant to have people efface themselves for the sake of the partnership. It's to prevent a minimum standard of liability so that businesses function properly in a society where we hope for more but don't always get it. So does Meinhardt, does Salmon really have to love Meinhardt? Does he have to love him the way that uh, the Bible talks about God's love, God's self-sacrificial love, no. No, that's not the standard in corporate law for many reasons. For one thing, it's too indefinite. What does it even mean to have that amount of, of dedication? And it's just too lofty. But it does have a certain value. If what we're striving towards is this notion that partners in a business should put the needs of the business first. I say should, not must very deliberately, should, not must, put the needs of the business first. This promotes trust. This provides for a better society. This concept, which is as old as Luke, and I'm sure older still, uh, promotes trust and reduces this agency cost. If you can trust your fellow to be the Good Samaritan, you don't have to watch out for them in the same way. But that's fundamentally different than the law coming in and saying, if you don't always put the needs of the business before all of your own needs, you're liable for damages. And so what we see in Meinhard vs. Solomon is a story about aspiration, about what Cardozo wishes for a society, but not necessarily what he would require of society. He doesn't even require filio. He doesn't require partners even necessarily like each other, just that they fulfill some minimum standard despite what the language says. We will see what that minimum standard is. If you want a sneak peek, check out the Model Business Corporations Act, Section 8.30, and compare it to Section 8.31. We'll get to that, by the way. We're going to go over all these. This is a preview day. But if you look at those sections, we have the standards of conduct and the standards of liability. Even in the Model Business Corporations Act, we have one bar for what we want you to do and one bar for what you can get sued for. And it's a lot lower. Why? Because the more that we can trust people in society, the more we reduce these agency costs, the less risk we have. And uh, people have described it as the lubricant, right? Trust is the lubricant that makes businesses more frictionless, that makes society function better. But it is not for us as lawyers to enforce that standard. Right? That's for somebody else. As lawyers, down here on earth, we have a much lower standard, but as ethical lawyers, we can always encourage our clients to do more. And I think that's the biggest meaning from Cardozo's case. All right, there's a couple other fun facts about this case. So as a result of this case, the 
partners got a 50-50 share in the upcoming project, right? Meinhard should be delighted. Meinhard should be delighted that he got half of this business deal. He won the case. But in an odd twist, it was actually Salmon who every year on the anniversary of this case would send a beautiful bouquet of flowers to Justice Cardozo. Isn't it odd for the loser in a case to send flowers to the judge who wrote the opinion each and every year? Why? Why would the loser in this case send flowers to Judge Cardozo? You know? Yes. Because he would have lost all the money. He would have lost millions. It turned out to be a terrible investment. And now it was borne equally by these partners. So there was a little twist in that. 